Let's talk about a really important issue, and that's how do you rehab or how do you treat, how do you incorporate a, an, an established dog, an older dog, um, that's been disadvantaged? We'll talk about what that means, what you can do. Um, you know, so many of us adopt dogs or take in older dogs, and I want to help you help that dog adjust just as I set my puppies up for success. And so there's a lot that we can do. Um, so we're going to discuss and tackle that today for those of you that have rescued a dog, adopted a dog, um, helped a friend out, helped a family member out. Uh, more than anything, I want to normalize rehoming dogs. There's definitely the stigma and judgment that you should never rehome your dog, that you're a bad person. And that really tends to affect negatively affect our dogs what i want to do is normalize it's okay to rehome a dog when you're putting their needs above your own when you're putting their needs above the judgment and the stigma you may get um, and you have the best intentions going into getting a dog and sometimes it just doesn't work out and i feel and i need it to be okay that we can rehome a dog if done so correctly so we're going to talk about that today for us to assume or put this unreal, unrealistic expectation on ourselves that it's a lifelong commitment when we as humans can't even stay married for the most part um, and we have friendships come and go and we have to do what's best for us, um, we also have to do what's best for our dogs. And in that case, many times it is rehoming them. But now to set up that person, if it's you, if it's somebody else, setting them up to succeed with this placement, that's what we're going to talk about today, whether it's just helping them adjust or if they have been disadvantaged. So we're going to tackle the power of no longer living in the past for a disadvantaged, quote unquote, rescue dog. And I'm going to talk about why I don't like that word to continue to be used when you're defining your dog, because that's exactly what it does. It makes them um, live in their past. We're well-intentioned and we don't mean to, but if you continue calling your dog a rescue dog and treating them like a rescue dog, you're doing them a huge disservice. So the dog has a far more powerful mind than we do in the sense of not living in the past, not thinking about the past, not letting the past define them. We have been doing that uh, disservice. We can help them actually move forward without constantly making them live in the past. So we're gonna talk about what that looks like, how you can do that, how you can truly use the power of a dog, their brain, um, to help them move past any uh, negative experiences they may have had in the past. And so we want them to move forward emotionally and literally physically um, to overcome some of these, generally it's unrealistic fears um, that they may have. So why could they have these unrealistic fears? And the problem with continuing to define them as such is holding them back. I mean, do you always want to be defined by, by one time in your life? Like we don't want to be defined by that either. We don't want to be defined by what could potentially have been a failure, even if it wasn't our fault. So we don't want to be defined. A dog doesn't want to be defined by it was an unwanted pregnancy. They were dumped alongside the road. Uh, they've been hit by a human. They've been ignored and their needs not met. met. Um, they have been lost. They've been hit by a car. Uh, their family just giving them up because they had a move, couldn't afford them. It wasn't a right fit. Like quit making the dog live in one defining moment for the rest of their life. That's unfair. So if you're going to go into rescuing a dog, I like to call disadvantage because at some point they did have a disadvantage, but they don't have to live that way. We don't want to live that way. We don't want our children to live that way. We as a spouse or partner don't want to live that way. We don't want it constantly thrown in our face and we're uh, unintentionally doing so by constantly referring them as a rescue dog, giving them those that pity, that human emotion that they're a rescue dog and feeling sorry for them. You're keeping them from living a healthier, more balanced life. So why could they be disadvantaged? Bad breeding can absolutely be a disadvantage um, if, if it was health or emotional, um, physical or emotional. If, if breeders are using you know, dogs that are nutty or aggressive or have a lot of anxiety, that can translate to their offspring. 
So a lot of my work in mentorship is educating and, and working with breeders and teaching them this, how this can truly have an effect, how we have to look at temperament of our breeding dogs just as much as health. So bad breeding can absolutely uh, create a disadvantaged dog. Isolation can create a disadvantaged dog, whether it's from the breeder initially, um, that the dog stayed with the breeder too long and they were isolated, and or a family or human you know, bought the dog got the dog, however they obtained the dog, and um, because they were had too much energy, they were too assertive, they created too much disharmony in the house, they were kept outside and isolated, or locked in a kennel too much, isolated. This is very, very common when people get a dog they cannot handle, um, and they can't meet their needs, so they do what they feel the only thing they can do, and that's isolate them in some form or another. And this is why we need to normalize rehoming, because that's not what's in the best interest of the dog. And so if you know they have a lot of energy, or they're too assertive for you to manage, or whatever issues going on, you need to just be upfront and honest when rehoming and find someone that, that can meet those needs. And this dog could absolutely be a balanced, happy dog. I've taken dogs that have been returned, my own puppies that have been returned, um, some of them coming off of isolation, turned around, brought them back here with us, met their needs in order, let them be a dog. Again, built trust, built a bond, and we've turned around and put them right into service dog training and they have lived out their life in that fashion. So just because a dog is being rehomed, is is doesn't speak ill of the dog or that there's something wrong with the dog it just needs a different placement a different human so we've personally i've had personal experience with this um and taking dogs back and fine-tuning them and letting them be safe again and be a dog again and then finding the correct placement and i'm so thankful for my owners humans that have acknowledged like I'm not the best place for this dog this is not in the best interest of the dog another reason why we can have a disadvantaged dog is it's just a well-intentioned human too often we are um, not handling fear correctly even in a puppy you get a puppy and if you're not handling fear um, or any negative experience correctly we, we will then create more fear to unrealistic things and create a fearful dog that has confidence issues Dogs with confidence issues then turn around and bite or pee or hide, flee. They become more difficult to manage because they're not in a healthy state of mind. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of our disadvantaged dogs have become that way with well-intentioned humans. I know it's, a, it's not a nice thought, but it is true. Um, it's just the reality. So I'm working so hard on educating humans on how to handle fear in your puppies. I've got a lot of videos on my YouTube channel, 4E Kennels, how to handle fear in your puppy um, is, is one of the videos. It's incredibly important to watch um, and meeting your dog's needs and orders. We'll talk about that a little today, but well-intentioned humans is a reason why a lot of our dogs are disadvantaged. Let's let go of the past. They should no longer, the past should no longer define them. We bring pity to rescue dogs. And part of it is, let's just be real, it makes us feel better, right? We put stickers on our car. I rescued, I love my rescue dog. We put magnets and stickers on things. We have shirts and clothes that, you know, announce you've rescued a dog. You do that in the name of also making you feel better. Um, but what, and that's fine if, if that's what you need to do. Um, and if it does save lives, of course, I'm totally for that. Uh, those of you that are following me also know that I think we need to train our breeders, educate our breeders, support our breeders, and then buy from those breeders. Um, we cannot all be dog lovers and only support and value those dogs gained by the proxy of rescue or, um, shelters because most of those dogs do come from ill-intentioned breeders. And so we're literally just, we're, we keep buying, the public keeps funding puppy mills and ill-intentioned breeders. You're, you're buying those dogs. And then because the match isn't good or the breeding's not good or something changed in your life, um, you weren't given temperament information, um, these dogs are then relinquished to the shelter or a rescue group. So that's where the cycle starts. It shouldn't be 
um, adopt, don't shop, we should absolutely value our good breeders so we have less in the shelters and in rescue groups. Uh, you should only buy a dog if you can absolutely return that dog to the same person. That should be the first question you ever, ever ask. Can I return if at any time this doesn't work out? And then do you see they should go back to the breeder and not a rescue or a shelter? So, um, Sorry, got off on a tangent, but I feel very, very strongly about this. Going into taking in a dog that may have been disadvantaged, you cannot pity them or feel sorry for them. It Don't define them anymore by whatever happened in their past, whether you actually know or not. We tend to always very quickly, if we see a dog that lacks in confidence or cowers or is hand shy, absolutely think this dog's been abused. And we let that define them. And we, we coddle them, we pity them, we make excuses for them. And what we're doing is we're holding them back from being the best they can be. We're not empowering them. We're not giving them the ability to believe in themselves. We're keeping them stuck in this frame of mind that there's something actually wrong with them. When their new leader, their new human is feeling those emotions of pity and making excuses and coddling, they truly wonder what's wrong with them and you're not a strong leader they can trust. Um, and so it just creates, they continue to be unsure, they continue to, to struggle with confidence. You continue to think, oh, this poor dog was abused. It, at some point, it doesn't matter anymore. To ma it matters how we're going to move forward to empower this dog, whether they've been hit or not. Um, stop having pity. Stop feeling sorrow for the misfortune of potentially what their past was. Stop making excuses for them. When you truly care, you make an effort, not an excuse. So we want to make efforts to help empower this dog, to have them believe in their own abilities and to move forward. We're not going to live in the past anymore. We're not going to let anything from the past define them anymore. Stop coddling them. Let them Show them the world is safe, people are kind, and dogs are friendly. For every one negative experience a dog has had, and you may not know how many negative experiences they've had with something, for every negative experience, we had to literally have like 10 positive to start to rewire the brain. Look, I know you got attacked at the dog park by a dog, but I need you to know dogs are safe. And what we tend to do is then, you should avoid the dog park. I'm I'm just going to say right now, I don't think that you should bring your dog to a dog park because you cannot control what other dogs will do. And then what that translates to is you can't be trusted as a leader. You literally and willingly put your dog in harm's way. Um, if you know the group of dogs and you've been going, that's one thing. Dogs should be able to play with each other. But going into random dog parks with dogs you don't know, um, you're setting yourself up and your dog to fail if they get attacked. So let's say they get attacked by a dog even out walking at a dog park, it happens, right? Um, we need to now show them rather than be like, oh my gosh, I feel so sorry for you. I'm going to coddle you. I feel responsible. So I'm going to push those emotions on you. So actually now we're backsliding. We're literally telling the dog they should absolutely fear other dogs. You can't protect them. That's what you're telling them by acting in this, in, in this way with these emotions that you're portraying, that's mirroring to the dog. The, a dog mirrors your emotions. Um, the more anxious you are, the more anxious of a dog you have, right? Um, so if you're feeling pity and or feeling sorry for them and feeling bad about it, you're actually reinforcing they should fear other dogs. Instead, you should be like, you know, this is what you should tell yourself. That was a crap situation. Um, but I have to continue showing my dog that dogs really are, are good. It's not something that they should fear. And I have to do a better job making sure this doesn't happen again. And that's just the reality. So you have to get them right back out. They have to meet 10, 15 dogs have positive. We had to rewrite the Nate, that one negative experience with 10, 15 positive experiences. You have to work through that with your dog. Um, you know, a, a dog can only focus on one thing and a dog can only stay in a state of mind of fear for so long. Um, and then they'll come out of it. Forward movement through the fear is really powerful. Sitting and waiting through the fear can be powerful, but you have to show them it's okay without doing so in a bull, like, don't be a bully about it. Um, be empowering, be a cheerleader, bring treats, make it fun, short and fun, meet this dog short and fun and leave, meet this other dog short and fun and leave, meet the third dog short and fun and leave, like just rewrite that negative experience. This works for humans as well, right? Like it's, it's a very powerful approach. So four essential steps to move forward.
forward. Number one, so let's say we bring the dog into our house. We're not talking about specific events anymore. We're talking about initially, how can we help these dogs adjust? How can you set up a positive relationship with these dogs to truly help them not live in the past anymore, not be defined by the past anymore, um, and help them be stable, neutral, balanced, happy dogs that don't have all these unrealistic fears. I mean, you've been given such a gift to take in a dog. Um, that has been disadvantaged, that you can truly change their life and not just in because you coddle them and reinforce their fears and keep them living in the past and pity them. Um, this is what is truly powerful is to see this dog change and really trust a human and have a bond with a the human they probably never really had in a healthy way. So the first thing you can do if they're feeling really overwhelmed, I know this is weird, it sounds counterproductive, but remember the dog mind is not the same as the human mind and it's ignoring them. Too often we have, we just have the whole family whoosh in on this new dog because we do, we want to show them all this love and everything and all this attention. And it actually causes uh, the, the opposite problem. It makes them feel too much human pressure on them and they shut down more. And now they don't trust you. They don't understand why all this pressure is on them, human pressure, the, the emotion, why all this emotion is on them. They're feeling excitement and pity and all these things. Um, and they don't, they don't understand what to do with that. And then you all become kind of unreliable. So their pack in their new home is flooded with all of these emotions. If you can be as neutral as possible, um, if the dog does have confidence issues or is hesitant with people, you need to ignore initially and let them on their terms approach you. That is so very, very powerful and impactful in helping these dogs. You're letting them know right off the bat, I honor you, I respect you, I see you, I hear you, I understand you, and I'm not going to put human pressure on you this is on your terms. I'm here. I'm fair. I'm consistent. You can trust me. And I'm going to show you because I'm going to let you come to me when you are ready. When they do come to me, then it's praise, food, love and affection. Um, you don't initiate love and affection and touch if that is something that they struggle with. Let them do it on their terms. So let them feel safe in their new space with their new human by honoring and respecting them. Too often we jump in and shower them with cuddles accompanied with pity, which equals an emotional disaster they are not being allowed to move forward from. Um, so get on a schedule, routine, be fair, consistent. Um, and you may just have to do some ignoring because in their mind, that's very safe. If they're really outgoing and, and love, you know, this is not an issue, then you don't need to ignore. I'm speaking specifically on dogs that are unsure of you, your children, anybody in the house. So we all need to become like this very um, neutral, trusting human that will not push themselves on the dog. Number two, exercise. We forget forward movement. Literally forward movement is powerful. If the dog ever gets stuck in a fearful stage, um, just start moving. Start moving the dog whether it's outside, inside, on a leash, lots of exercise, especially at first, you should be playing a lot with them and exercising them a lot. They need to learn uh, and kind of be reset to be a dog again. Many times when getting a disadvantaged dog, that was one of the main um, things that they were lacking was, was healthy physical exercise. So like we talked about dogs locked in the front yard, locked in a kennel too much. Um, this is almost always something they were lacking. Many times it isn't even love and affection they were lacking. They were lacking their mental and physical stimulation. So anytime they shut down, put the leash on, head out for a brisk walk or jog, lots of praise and forward movement. If they are the more sensitive dog and you're doing the ignore phase, um, just verbal praise. You're doing good. Yes, yes, you're doing good. Let's go. Look at you go. Like you just have to be a cheerleader. Like everything's very positive. And they're going to look to you like, really? Is this good? Really? I'm doing good. Yes, you're doing good. So reinforce, uh, you know, reassure them, reinforce. I believe in you. This, you're doing a good job. Literally forward movement can be life-changing for them. If they're unsure of being touched, respect that boundary. Verbal praise is powerful. Number three, the powerful three is, or number four is the power three series that I have is sit on the dog, hand feeding, tether training. These three things uh, can make all the difference in the world with bonding. The tether training is huge. 
um, hand feeding. Everything comes from me. This is a pack that will provide. You never have to worry about your, your basic needs here. Um, and the sit on the dog helps retrain them if they're having lack of focus issues. It's kind of always one or the other. Dogs are rehomed because they're fearful and they shut down. Um, and or they have a lot of energy and they're assertive and bossy and jumping all over everyone and tearing everything up and counter serving and just out of control. The sit on the dog is great for either one of those extremes. Um, you can access on the 4E Kennels U YouTube channel. I, I suggest any dog owner, if you've not seen these three, if you've not implemented these three things, please do so. This is powerful for any dog. It really helps build a bond um, that's built on trust and respect. It's on a playlist called the Power 3 Series, so go check those out. Number four, meeting their needs in order. This, again, they're... There's no disadvantaged dog that has had their needs met in order and teaching them to be a dog again, which might be needed. Um, well, it almost always is needed. I, I don't know any situation that I've gotten a dog return that I haven't had to teach them to be a dog again through exercise, forward movement, and meeting their needs in order. The first thing a dog needs, other than their basic needs, shelter and food, is rules, boundaries, and limitations. This is very, very um, important and going back to the whole idea of keeping them in the space and defining moment of a rescue dog, you're not giving them rules, boundaries, and limitations. We feel like, you know, this dog's been disadvantaged. They can do what they want. We make excuses. They can take what they want. Um, poor thing shouldn't be in a kennel because it was too much. Eh, wrong frame of mind. This is my pack. These are the rules, boundaries, and limitations. You will be kennel trained. You will walk nicely on a leash. They need that commanding presence to be able to trust you. This is a basic need for every single dog. This is the first thing they need to feel safe, to be balanced, to respect you. Um, there is no true bond of mutual respect if you can't stand in your space and have rules, boundaries, and limitations for your dog. So quit feeling sorry for them. Be, uh, be empowering, empowering, <laughs> build respect and trust, have them believe in their own abilities and have rules, boundaries, and limitations. The second need they need is mental and physical exercise. Many disadvantaged dogs are missing this as well. So lots of exercise, mental and physical. Dogs feel good. They were bred to work with and for humans in some capacity, every single breed, whether it's protecting livestock, whether it's being a protection dog, whether it's being a lap dog. Dogs were specifically bred to function in some form with and for a human. So uh, giving them mental exercise, something they can accomplish, giving them a purpose, even if it's trying to get their food out of a water bottle, you let dry out, you pull the tag off, you put all their food in a water bottle, you put it on the floor and they had to figure it out. They get so proud. They feel accomplished. They feel like they did something. It's truly giving them an opportunity to feel purpose, to be proud, um, and really use their brain in a way that they all need to. So make sure you're doing mental and physical exercise. Third and lastly is love and affection when they're ready. Um, some dogs like a lot of physical love and affection. Some don't like a whole lot. So just really respect and understand and learn what is what's comfortable to them. Um, remember, especially with a disadvantaged dog, if they're hand shy, which means if you reach to pet them over the head and they cower, for one, that's a that's an inheritable trait. And so don't always think automatically, oh my gosh, this dog cowers. They're, they've been abused. It literally could be submission and or it, it's an inheritable trait as well. So if their parents, if, if it's in the lines of, of this dog uh, being hand shy, it could just be breeding. And so don't, don't have that pity, don't feel bad. Um, if they are hand shy because you reach over, really that's impolite anyway, put your hand under so that their chin, they can come and smell your hand and uh, put their head on your hand and then you can pet from there and see what's comfortable to the dog.
So giving love and affection. What's important is it's not just you meeting these orders, these needs, it's that you're doing it in order. So think about the little things, even if you get up in the morning, right? So you get up in the morning to get ready for work. Rules, boundaries, limitations. I have to make sure that's implemented always first. So they slept in the kennel at night. Great. And I'm not saying they can't sleep in your room. I'm just using this as an example. They slept in the kennel. So that was a rule, right? The boundaries, you can't be on the couch. You can't be on um, the bed. You're going to sleep in your kennel. That is your limitation. That's that's where you are at in my pack. You haven't earned anything else yet. You will earn everything. You will feel proud by doing that. Um, and it's an understanding that we have. So out of the kennel they go. Then I'm going to put them right outside. Now they get their mental and physical exercise. They can go out and go potty. That's a rule, right? You potty outside. Now you can run and play and sniff and de-stress and, and physical exercise. You can go out and play fetch. So now we're doing some physical and mental exercise. That's what I love about games like Fetch because they have to think about it. You're working with and for, they're human. Even go beyond what dogs that love to fetch and learn. Have them drop the ball in your hand. Teach them things like that. Have them sit and wait and, and fetch on command. Just little things like that make a huge difference in rules, boundaries, limitations, mental exercise, and physical. Like you're, you, you drop the mic. You're like covering all of those, right? You're covering one and two with one type of exercise and um, interaction. Then when they come inside and they're a calmer state of mind, I'll give love and affection. I don't give love and affection when they're in an anxious or excited state of mind because then I'm inadvertently rewarding that behavior. So love and affection always comes after one and two have been met and they're in a calm state of mind. And now see, look, they're fulfilled, they feel safe, they have an understanding, there's consistency, there's a schedule. They feel good and uh, balanced because all of their needs have been met in order. And this alone is incredibly powerful, especially for a disadvantaged dog, but all dogs in general. So as a reminder, the four essential steps in moving forward and creating a bond and helping this disadvantaged dog truly shine and be happy and fulfilled and be a productive member of society is ignoring uh, do not put emotional or physical pressure on this dog. Let them initiate until they can trust you if that's an issue. Exercise, literal forward movement is powerful if they shut down, if they get fearful, if they get over anxious, if they're having anxiety, go and exercise them. Don't sit and hug them and coddle them and feel bad for them and reassure them in a way that's not healthy. Reassure them through being powerful and empowering. We're going to go out. We're going to do forward movement. We're going to, we're literally going to sweat out. <laughs> I just say they're going to pant out the stress and the anxiety. And that is incredibly healthy for not only dogs, but humans too, right? Um, number three or the fourth, the third, the power three series, go watch those The sit on the dog, the hand feeding, the tether training should be incorporated with any dog you ever own and meeting their needs in order should be incorporated with any dog you own, but especially when, when bringing in an older dog um, into your pack. Difficult decisions. If you're on the other side of this, I want people to know and I, I, would, I want to normalize this. I don't want it that people don't take uh, getting a dog seriously. That's not what I'm saying at all. It is a huge commitment. I want it to be done seriously. I want breeders to evaluate the puppies so that you can pick the puppy that meets your needs and that you know you can meet their meet needs the best. That's when magical things happen. That's when the magical match occurs. Um, but many of you, and I have too, taken in older dogs. Um, if it's not working out or you bought a puppy and it's not working out, um, and you've tried everything, you've truly given it a chance, but you know now the, the quality of life of the dog is suffering, that's when you need to put the dog's needs first. And it's not about you anymore. It's not about you saving face or trying not to be judged or having to explain to people why you no longer have a dog. I want you to be proud of the fact that you put this dog's needs first. I want you to be able to stand in your own space and say, no, I had to do what was best for the dog. I was not able to meet their needs. There's nothing people can say to that reply. No. Buddy doesn't live here anymore. I wasn't able to meet his needs. He was a much better dog than I was able to um, give him uh, 
you know, the ability to be here with me, I was holding him back. So I found a human that absolutely could, or another home or however you want to word it, that absolutely could meet his needs and he's thriving and happy and successful and that you should be proud of. So when you do rehome though, please do so with honesty. Always give people like the worst case scenario, you know, like so if you are having some fear issues or energy, assertiveness, submission, be be as honest as you can to ensure the possibility of it being a forever home. That's the goal. If we get the match right, uh, you know, if we align the needs and wants of both human and dog, that they're the same needs and wants, that's when they stay in the home. And please always, always make sure they've been spayed or neutered. Make sure that's done before you ever, ever rehome a dog, because unfortunately, someone could use them to breed. And uh, we, we don't want those kind of people breeding. So get your dog spayed or neutered if you're rehoming. So um, again, I, you know, appreciate uh, those that take on rescue dogs and helping them rehab. I hope this was eye-opening for you. I hope if this can help one dog that's being rehomed or in a shelter or rescue that you are taking on, um, this can and is life changing for them. And that is the goal to, to keep them in their home. So I'm Jeanette with 4E Kennels. We're only healing hearts and changing lives through the power of a dog, but we are changing breeding from bad to badass. And these are things that, um, you know, it all has, one thing has to do with the other. We all need to work together, breeders, trainers, rescue groups, shelters, and you, the owners, you, what we call the public, <laughs> the owners of these dogs, buy responsibly, own responsibly. Um, our dogs deserve more. And this is just one step in truly honoring them and making things better for them.